Imagine a world without film. No cinemas. No films to put you in a good mood. And no Christmas movies to put us in the festive spirit. Well, without the Lumiere brothers, I wouldn't even be talking to you about film as a subject right now. I'm going to take you back to when film first became a possibility. Well, not that far. In 1895, August and Lewis, known as the New Mirror Brothers, projected the first film. Both brothers were technically minded, allowing them to create a device combining camera with printer and projector. For this device to work efficiently, it needed to be hand cranked, recording a film of up to 16 frames per second. Using this device, the Lumiere brothers created their first film, called The Waterer Watered. Much like the filmmakers of today, they took inspiration from their own experiences. For example, they always kept the main action in the centre of the frame, much like they would have seen in a the theatre. Even when the character walks away, the other brings him straight back to where? Drum roll, please. The centre of the frame. The whole film is shot in one take and is not using long shot. This would be because, once again, using their own experiences, they wouldn't have experienced a close-up of an object whilst watching a play in a theatre, so why would they think to include this within their own films? Here is my own example, a recreation of their film style to show my understanding of how film was perceived in 1895. Flashbacks had already existed in novels, Scene changes were already a part of live theatre productions, and even narrated sequences visually existed within comic strips. However, early filmmakers were afraid that splicing different shots together would confuse audiences. But, in 1896, a man named George Melier accidentally discovered what we would know now as a jump cut. Whilst filming, his camera jammed, and by the time he began recording the footage again, the object he was filming was gone, as if by magic. This new technique became very popular and was most used to create illusions for a dramatic or comical effect. Back then, audiences would have easily believed it to be real, compared to now. If a modern day audience were to watch it, we would know it was fake, due to the fact that we have seen more examples of it having seen it done before. Here is an example from The Execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, a film by Alfred Clarke made in 1985. This film uses two shots, spliced together to create the illusion of the lady being beheaded. The first, the actress present. The second, a replica of the character's body with a prop for her head, is placed in the position that the actress was in. So when she is beheaded, the illusion is created as the prop head falls to the floor. Another example of using jump cuts to create illusions is The Haunted Castle, a film by George Melier in 1897. I have also created my own example using this technique. In 1903, Edwin Porter discovered that by using editing, if you splice scenes together you can create a film of around 10 minutes long, which meant the duration of film was now moving forward. The individual scenes shot put together were usually shot in a long shot and were unedited. An example of this technique, the Great Train Robbery, made by Edwin Porter. This first scene includes a projector screen placed behind the set, so as the clip of the train going past is projected, it creates the effect of an open window with the vehicle outside this building. For us as a modern day audience, watching a film shot in long shot for 10 minutes may become boring and uninteresting. If this scene were to be shot by modern day filmmakers, it would include close-ups of bags and purses being stolen, hands going into pockets, scared facial expressions, point of view shots and so on. However, 1903 filmmakers were still taking inspiration for what they had seen themselves, and that had yet to be the art of close-ups. Therefore, I made my own example showing a modern day version with inspiration from this film. Hands where I can see them! Thank you. 
you for your cooperation. In 1903, the same year, Edwin Porter discovered that he could include the audience watching into his films by showing them more detail within the scene than even the actors there present, by moving the camera closer to show important objects to help convey the narrative further. An example that shows this is one of Edwin's own films, The Gay Shoe Clerk. By using a close-up, Porter has broken the barrier of only using a long shot and has changed the way audience experience films then and now. Another filmmaker at that time was D.W. Griffiths. Porter and Griffiths were competitive with each other in terms of film and using different techniques, but imagine how much competition within the film industry there is now, compared to back then in the early 1900s. In 1910, a new technique was created, montage. This is when separate shots are put together but are from different times and places. One of the best examples of montage used within film is from the film Rocky, made in 1976. This montage allows the audience to see the character building up his strength ready for the main event. This technique is a clever way of showing time passing in under three minutes. We see the character in different places and outfits which indicates each scene is a different day or in some montages a week and is a clever device to allow filmmakers to visually show the character's progression rather than the character mentioning it that they have been training and making the audience believe it. Furthermore, because the audience has physically seen the hard work that this character has put in, it allows them to feel emotionally connected and can appreciate what the character has done to get to where he is now. The music also has a massive part within this montage, as the more the music builds, the harder we see the character working. Here is my own example using the montage technique on a much smaller scale. Another device developed in 1910s was a technique called parallel editing. This device includes two or more scenes spliced together with the impression that they are happening at the same moment in time. This technique is achieved by editing using the audio from one scene over the top of another. This can be used to create tension, for example the film The Godfather made in 1972 as the victim is trying to be reached before they are killed. By using this device, the audience are aware of the dangers ahead and therefore leaves them scared and worried about what might happen and also leaves them feeling included because it's almost as though they want to warn the character about what's to come, so they feel helpless in the situation. In 1903, when Edwin Porter produced The Great Train Robbery, he touched slightly on the subject of parallel editing with his use of crosscuts, however he didn't use this technique to its full potential, which left it open for other filmmakers to take over as their own. Here is also my own short example of using the parallel editing technique. So in today's tutor class, we're going to be doing algebra. Um, and so we've got four equations up here which I'd like you to solve. Um, so Sam, could you tell us the first one which is 10A and 8B equals what? Um, 18AB. 18AB. Okay, so what well done. Now, Jess, yes. um, could you tell us the next one, please? 8x <coughs> add something equals 16x. What is the something? Uh, a. Well done. Um, now, where is uh, Emily? She's meant to be here, isn't she? Our final device to look at is rhythmic editing. This technique consists of the timing of the shots depending on the situation. Different moods can be portrayed through the speed or rhythm of editing. For example, in the film The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock made in 1963, one of the scenes includes the birds attacking one of the female characters. In this scene, as the birds begin to fly around, the shots become increasingly rapid, keeping the audience on the edge of their seats. This technique also conveys how the character is feeling. As the birds fly all around, the clips keep changing rapidly on screen, making the audience feel panicked, and with the build-up of the music playing, they are left wondering what is going to happen. Here is another example of the same technique. However, it is used within CGI imagery in the film Transformers.
I have also made my own example of this technique, the idea being that the characters are playing roulette, making sure that the edit of the shots pick up rhythm as the characters become more panicked towards the end. So, I think it's safe to say that film wouldn't be what it is today without the use of editing. There are three main reasons why we edit. Number one, the shots taken by filmmakers are often too long, so by using editing we can trim these clips down. Number two, a filmmaker will always film a scene more than once and then decide which clip to use in the final outcome, so by editing it makes this possible to do this. And number three, filmmakers will normally shoot more than they need to or decide to open the scene in a different section. Therefore, editing allows filmmakers to change the look of a scene if they decide they do not like the original. The average shooting ratio can vary from around 6 to 1 or 10 to 1. So, for an hour and a half film, this usually is between 9 to 15 hours of footage to cut down to and sort through. Editing allows filmmakers to pick out the best bits to place into the final sequence. So overall, by editing films we are able to improve the final outcome. And I guarantee that the films you and I have seen would look completely different without having been edited. Much like I've just demonstrated, the film and editing industry will continue to grow, improve and amaze us. We will always have that one film that stands out as our favourite. Edited or unedited, film is a part of history and will remain forever. <laughs>